Good evening and welcome to Freedom Baptist Church of Chesapeake in our midweek time of Bible study and prayer. Last week we looked at King Saul and tonight we're going to look at a man after God's own heart, the beginnings of King David. So let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Lord, thank you for your blessings and for your grace in our lives. I pray that you will continue to work in each life, continue to accomplish your purpose. I pray for the Awana clubs next door, that you will work in the children's hearts, that you will draw them to yourself, that they will be saved at a young age and grow up to be godly men and women. I pray for the workers. I pray, pray that you will bless them. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege that we can come together and study your word together. Bless our time this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we're going to start at chapter 13, a verse that I read last week with reference to Saul. But then we're going to quickly move into chapter 16. Remember when Saul made an offering unto the Lord, he offered a sacrifice that he was not supposed to offer. And in <clears throat> chapter 13, Samuel says to him in verse 11, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. I kind of like that phrase. That sounds kind of ironic, doesn't it? I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. You know, when you try to give God excuses, it doesn't always work very well. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That's our first indication that there is someone else that God has chosen to replace King Saul. So now turn down to chapter 16. In chapter 16 comes after that section where Saul is supposed to kill the Amalekites and kill all of the animals, and yet they saved the best. And Saul says, well, the people did that. I saved the king, but the people saved the best animals alive to offer as a sacrifice to the Lord your God. And Samuel said, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. You know, the problem with sin is sometimes we think, oh, if I do this, I'll just go to God and ask him to forgive me. Well, that's a very poor way of looking at sin. In fact, we need to fear sin more than we need to fear just the consequences of sin. So in chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So Samuel does what the Lord tells him. And then uh, when he comes, uh, 
David's father, Jesse, is nervous. The elders of the city are nervous. It says in verse 4 that they came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? So they were really nervous about what was happening. And Samuel tells them, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And now this is a fascinating section here, one of, one of my favorites, and one that tells us a lot about how God views people. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him for the Lord sees not as man sees man looks on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart wow that's quite a statement isn't it Samuel don't look on his appearance or on his height his stature because I have rejected him. You see, God sees what no one else can see. And it says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, his second, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and beautiful and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. That Hebrew word here we're going to see again, that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, came upon David and was on him from that day forward. Do you remember what happened with Saul? The Spirit came upon him, but then the Spirit left him. And that's a good indication that the indwelling of the Spirit in the Old Testament is not the same as the indwelling of the Spirit in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, as believers who are in Christ, we are given His Spirit. But in the Old Testament... They had something that we call the theocratic anointing, where God anointed them for a particular task. You will see it all through the book of Judges, where the judges had the Spirit come upon them, and then they would go and do a task for the Lord. But in verse 14, now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And a harmful spirit, the word there for harmful is the same word that's used of evil. A harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. That's quite a thought, isn't it? Have you ever thought that sometimes people who are ungodly, that perhaps some of the issues that they struggle with and wrestle with, are because of their ungodliness 
You know, we live in a world where people don't even like to give consideration for that kind of a thing. But here we're told that the Lord sent a spirit to torment him. That Hebrew word there has the idea of terrorize. Now, God is not a domestic terrorist, okay? But God does discipline people. And when you go to the book of Romans, the first chapter in the book of Romans, sometimes people will ask me, will God bring judgment upon America because of its sin? And if you look at the first chapter in Romans, you will find that part of God's judgment upon a people is that God turns them over to their vile passions and their lusts. So some of the things that we see going on in our country are an indication that God is already bringing judgment upon America. But here the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And in verse 15, Saul's servant said to him, Behold now a harmful spirit from, the, from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Huh, what a coincidence. Do you believe in coincidence? Nope. This is God's providence, isn't it? Uh, the son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. Isn't that something? This young man had recognized David had a good testimony. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. So David was the one who took care of the sheep, and Saul asked Jesse to send his son. Now, we don't relate to this quite like they did back then, but the one who took care of the sheep was not the mightiest person among the family, okay? Taking care of the sheep, that was for the lowest of the low. So David comes from humble beginnings. And so to make a long story short, Jesse sends David to Saul and David played and David played skillfully. Now, we have a book in the Old Testament called the Psalms. And many of our Psalms were written by King David. Uh, David was a skillful musician. He was a phenomenal musician. And it says in verse um, 21 that David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Now, John MacArthur brings out that <clears throat> an armor bearer, the king would have many young men to be his armor bearers, not just one. So here, what we're seeing here is we're seeing God bring David into Saul's presence and into Saul's court because God has plans for David. And then in chapter 17, we have the, the famous uh, narrative about David and Goliath, the giant who is the... Uh, warrior of the Philistines. In chapter 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered, and he was, goodness, he was a mighty man. Uh, in verse 4, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, 
And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. So what does that tell you about Goliath? He is a bruiser. He is a big man. And he's the kind of a man you probably would not meet, you would not want to meet if you were enemies. So, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? What do the people want Saul for? Fight their battles to lead them, right? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. You believe that? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now notice this statement. When Saul and, I and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So the people wanted a man to lead them into battle. And we saw last week that there was a pretty good battle. And Saul led the people and won a victory. But now we've got a situation where Saul is scared. And I'll be honest with you, I don't blame Saul. I think if I had somebody like Goliath standing in front of me, I don't know if I'd have the courage David had. But Saul was supposed to be the leader, and he did, wasn't. But look at verse 12. It's neat how David is brought into this story. So when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. Now, have we met them before? Sure we did. Remember when Samuel went? And the first one, the second one, and the third one came before him, and God said, nope, he's not the one. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So here's the picture. David was an armor bearer to king. David did play for the king when he needed someone to play for him and comforted him and soothed him when he played. But David went back and forth from the farm and to where Saul was. And then in verse 16, for 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, okay, David, I want you to go and take a lunch to your brothers. I'm paraphrasing here. So you go and take this stuff to your brothers. And so David did. He rose early and he headed that way. And... When David gets there, in verse 23, as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to, up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich 
the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now, the ideas in these sentences, whoever kills Goliath is going to be greatly rewarded. To have the daughter of the king was significant. And that phrase, to make his father's house free in Israel, I read one commentator who pointed out that that indicated that the family would be free from taxes in the future. Wow. That's a significant reward, isn't it? And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? How's Eliab treating his brother? He's pretty snarky, isn't he? Being sarcastic. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word or a saying? Could be, was it not a question? Wasn't I just asking a question? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, talking about himself, your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said, You're not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Now, here's where his shepherding comes into play. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Now listen to this next statement of David's. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. What do we learn about David here? Okay, he's fearless, but is it just fearlessness? Okay, that's an important phrase, with regard to God. He is confident in the Lord, isn't he? He has confidence that just as the Lord delivered him from the bear and the lion, the Lord will deliver him from this Philistine. Verse 38, Saul tried to clothe David. He gave him armor, put a helmet of bronze on his head, and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried to, in vain to go, for he had not tested them. 
Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. How do you think Goliath's going to respond? Well, let's look down in verse 43. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. What do you think about that speech? What does that reveal about David? Is he confident in his own abilities? In his God-given abilities, absolutely yes. You know, as I've thought about David and as i thought about what he told Saul, there are things that we go through in our lives that prepare us for even greater things ahead. David had some battles on the field with the sheep, and they prepared him for this battle. But in all of this, what is this text helping us to see? God is working in this young man's life, isn't he? God is working through him. And David is talking to Goliath. He says, you come to me with a a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. So, in verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. Now, before I go any further, does anybody remember... Another time when we saw slingshots and stones. The Benjaminites, you're absolutely right. And it said they could sling stones and hit something within a hair's breath. That's how good they were with their sling stones. Now in Israel, I have seen sling stones. They're not a little bitty pebble like we used to shoot with our slingshot as a kid. I mean, these are some chunks of rock and uh it, his sling was not like a slingshot that i had as a little kid i mean we had a fancy one where it was metal and it hooked onto your wrist and then you could pull it back it had a pretty pretty good power to it but the slings that david had this had a pouch right in the middle and two long straps 
and you would hold the two straps and you'd have the sling stone inside the pouch and you'd swing it around and around and you would get up velocity and when you let that stone go, it would fly to its target. And it says that David ran to, toward the battle line and he put the his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed. I like that word prevailed. I think in that video last Sunday it was used. The word of God prevailed. Well, here David prevailed. He was victorious over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Now, what was it that the Philistine said? If you kill me, then we will all be your servants. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sha'araim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Now, at this time, Jerusalem was not part of their territory. Now, they may have had access to Jerusalem because Judah went up and defeated Jerusalem early on in Judges. But then later on, we find out that David, that's the first city that he conquers. But he brought the head to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now some people, and you may have this question yourself, some people have asked, well, why does it say here Saul doesn't know who David is, and yet earlier it said Saul loved David, and asked him to be his armor bearer. And that's a very good question. And one of the things that's going on here, if, if you are just playing a lute or a harp to soothe an angry, troubled king, do you think he's going to take a lot of interest in you? Or are you just going to be somebody, a, a fixture, playing gentle music to try to calm the king? So there would be no reason for King Saul to know David any more than at a distance. And the idea earlier where it says he sent a letter to Jesse asking for David to come. Well, let me ask you this. Did the kings write their own letters usually? No. They had somebody send messages for them. So when it says that Saul sent to Jesse and asked for David to come... That doesn't mean that Saul himself is the one who sat down. and it, it wasn't as easy today, I mean, back then as it is today to sit down and write a letter to somebody. But even back in chapter 16, it talks about how that Saul sent messengers in order to inquire. But here, if it's true that the one who defeated Goliath was going to get to marry the king's daughter, then do you think the king might have a little bit more interest in who that person is? Absolutely. 
And not only that, do you think the king might have some interest in a, a young man who proves himself to be a mighty warrior in defeating the champion of the Philistines? You betcha he's going to be interested. And then finally, if there's the chance that his family and his household could have their taxes forgiven, then wouldn't it make sense that he asks, whose son are you? Where do you come from? Who's your family? Though those pieces of information would be very important to know in this situation. And then in chapter 18, it says, As soon as he finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan, Jonathan was Saul's son. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So David and Jonathan became very good friends. And in verse 2, And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. What's the difference now in what we saw earlier? What we saw earlier is David went back and forth between watching over his father's sheep and being in the presence of Saul. But now Saul will not allow him to return to his father's house. And then it's interesting because I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but we're getting pieces of the narrative as we move along. And now in verse 6, we find out of chapter 18, we find out as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands. How do you think Saul felt when he heard that phrase? Pretty good. ooh I've struck down my thousands. And then the next phrase comes along. And David his ten thousands. What? And Saul was very angry. And the saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? You think Saul might be a little bit perceptive? Saul didn't know that Samuel had gone and anointed David. But Saul knew that God, through Samuel, had informed him the kingdom was going to be taken away from him, didn't he? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. Where did we see that word rushed earlier? Rushed upon David. Remember that? And now we see a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. And he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. And as he did day by day, Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. Saul wasn't happy, was he? So how would you like to be playing your, your lyre and... The king raising his spear and thrusting it at you <laughs> while you're playing, and you just sort of dodge the spear and keep on playing. That'd be pretty rough. You know what we can learn from David? We can learn that God was providentially working in David's life, God was in charge of this situation. And David 
Would you say David was doing what was right or what was wrong? Was David serving God or was David serving himself? He was serving God, wasn't he? You know, there may be times when you may do everything right and you may be serving the Lord rightly and you may have others jealous of you, angry against you, want to destroy you. That doesn't mean that you're not doing right. But through all of that, Number one, God will prepare you just like God prepared David. And then God can use you just like he used David to accomplish his purpose in his time and in his way. God is sovereign over all of these things. He's sovereign in choosing David. He's sovereign in preparing David. He's sovereign in placing David. And he's sovereign in protecting David. And you know what? The God of David is the God in our lives. And we can trust him. We can have confidence in him. Not in ourselves. But we can have confidence in what God is doing in us and through us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us the example of David. We know that David was not perfect. But David was a man after your own heart. He was a man you chose to use. And Lord, I pray that you will work in our lives. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be diligent. And as we have certain things happen to us, maybe they're against us or they're problems for us, help us to remember that you're still watching over us, providing for us, and taking care of us. And help us to be faithful to you. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.